Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless us in everything that we do today. Thank you for the bright sunshine and the that enlivens the, the spirits. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will bless us. Help us to be a blessing to everyone whom we meet this day. In Jesus' name, amen. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he had put the man he had formed. The Lord made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we skip to chapter 3, verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? It seems that mankind has been estranged from God ever since. God has been reaching out. Where are you? He says. Our worship today links nicely with what Marcel was saying yesterday about our experience with God. Because recently, our Sabbath school group were discussing worship. And the question arose, how do you experience God in worship? Well, several ways of experiencing were put forward. But a few members held the opinion that you cannot experience God. And it's just enough that you should believe. I can understand how they arrive at that conclusion. If you link experience with emotion, and given the Adventist traditional distrust of emotions, but my own upbringing influenced in my younger days, and I did have some younger days, I wasn't always this old, by reading Martin Buber's little book, I and Thou. He talks about his relationship with God being possible only in the second person, Thou. Because the third person God, talking about he, becomes more of an idol, a third person God. It all depends on your point of view. My feeling about experience uh, versus, uh, versus uh, observation was reinforced more recently when I heard Tom Wright point out that Western Christianity has accepted as its default mode, the, the thought, the, the philosophy, as the, is the philosophy of the enlightenment. So now we all think in terms of the enlightenment. In this outlook, we see everything from a fly on the wall point of view, like an independent observer, no longer being part of the action. So we've replaced experiencing with observing. And this seems to be our default mode. And this is the way in which we uh, do tend to think about God. Of course, this way of looking at things in general has brought much benefits to the world. Through scientific progress, development of inventions, old and new, but when we consider relationships, specifically our relationship with God, we find this is exactly the danger that Buber was warning about. The problem of experiencing God in the third person is that we have no direct count encounter with him. We have, so to speak, a second-hand God. Now, God has always wanted to have a relationship with mankind. As we read first in Eden, where he walked with Adam, but became estranged at the fall. 
for several centuries then he did speak directly with certain individuals, even if only intermittently. And in the Exodus, he asked Moses to build a more permanent place, a tabernacle in the desert, where I will meet with you, he said. And later, he commended David for wanting to build a temple for my name. And Darius, according to Ezra chapter 6, later referred to God as one who causes his name to dwell there in Jerusalem. The temple was indeed the place where God met with his people. In modern sci-fi language, the temple was the wormhole through which God could enter this world to meet with his people. Later, due to the apostasy of God's people, Ezekiel describes in chapter 10 how he had to watch as God departed from the temple in his chariot. And God wasn't seen again for almost 500 years. In the early first century AD, or do we have to say CE now, the people were excited by their reading of Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks. They could all count and they knew that something was going to happen. They were expecting God to appear at any time now. But when God did return to them, it was in an unexpected way. And they didn't recognize him. The Gospels describe it. They describe how in Jesus, the Messiah, God had returned to his people. Moreover, they went on to stress that he had supplanted the temple as the place where God meets his people. Because according to John 2, 19, he will destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. And that saying was remembered. His critics taunted with him, taunted him about it at the crucifixion. So the function of Jesus, according to the Gospels, the, sorry, the function of the temple, according to the Gospels, was transferred to the person, Jesus. But that wasn't the end of it. Jesus had to return. And there would be, that would be the end of the uh, connection between God and mankind. After his resurrection, according to John 20, he passed this on to his this function unto his disciples. John 20, verse 22. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. It really is a breathtaking moment. Jesus' followers, they themselves became the wormholes through which God could relate to the world. And this has been the task of the church through the centuries, to act as God's presence on earth, being his feet, his hands, his heart, demonstrating to the world what God is really like. I know it hasn't always undertaken, undertaken its work properly and sometimes tried to use the tools of the adversary to achieve God's desired ends. But when it has been true to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the world gradually became a better place. So that is our calling. To be a wormhole for God. And as we go about our work today, let us be God's hands, his feet, and his heart. And let us make the world a better place.